you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between two students, Peter and Susan. They will talk about their activities at the weekend. Answer questions one to four as you listen to their conversation. First, you'll have some time to look at the questions numbered one to four. Now listen to the conversation and circle the appropriate letter or letters for each question. Hi, Susan. Hi, Peter. It's Friday again. Anything particular you want to do at the weekend? No, nothing particular in mind. Maybe tonight I'll go to a pub with some friends for the happy hour. You know, drinks are half price at weekends, and I don't have to get up very early tomorrow. Saturday morning, that's the time for washing my car, doing the laundry, and then go out for brunch. That's breakfast and lunch combined, right? Yes, that's it. You can spend two hours or more over brunch. It's a huge meal. You can have all the breakfast things as well as all sorts of lunch things, such as salads, chicken, pies, and fruit. It's not expensive. You just pay seven pounds per person. For that, you can eat as much as you like. It's a good time for all the family. Oh, that sounds good. What do you usually do at weekends? On Sundays, I have a lot of newspapers to read. So do I. I sit in the garden over a cup of coffee with a continental breakfast and read that it's Sunday newspapers. Relax. How about Saturdays? Oh, I usually go to a club to play chess with some friends. I love the game very much. It's great fun, isn't it? Yes, lots of fun. I enjoy playing chess on Saturdays. I've never played chess, but I'd like to learn it some day. Is it difficult to learn? No, not at all. I can teach you if you like. A week later, now Susan is teaching Peter how to play chess. Listen to their conversation. As you listen, answer questions five to eight by writing one word for each answer, and answer questions nine to twelve by writing T if the statement is true, and F if the statement is false, and N if there is no information given. First, you'll have some time to look at questions five to twelve. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to twelve. Could you teach me how to play chess now? Yes, it's a board game played by two persons. How many pieces does each person have? Sixteen pieces. Each player has two rooks, two bishops, two knights, one king, one queen, and eight pawns. One person uses the light-coloured pieces, and the other plays with the dark-coloured pieces. The colours are always called white and black, even if they are cream and red. At the beginning of the game, the pieces are set up on the chessboard as shown in the picture. Oh, I see. There are sixty-four squares on the board. The rows of squares across the board are called ranks. You mean the horizontal rows? Yes, the rows of squares up and down. I mean the vertical rows are called files. Lines of squares running diagonally are called diagonals. How to move the pieces? There are some rules. Each of the pieces has to move in a certain way. The players take it in turns to move their pieces and can move only one piece in each turn. Once you have touched a piece, you must move it. After you have moved it and taken your hand away, you must leave the piece where it is. So, you are not allowed to change your mind. No. Each player has two knights: a king's knight and a queen's knight. They are shaped like a horse's head. The knight is the only piece which can jump over pieces. It can jump over pieces of its own colour, or over enemies' pieces.
the knight can move in any direction, forwards, backwards, or to either side, but it always has to move three squares at a time. When the knight moves, it must go two squares in one direction and then one square to the side. I have to remember this. What is the aim of the game? Well, it's to trap your opponent's king, so it can't escape being captured. That is, there are no squares for it to escape to, no pieces to protect it, and no pieces to capture the checking piece. When this happens, it is called checkmate, and the player with the checking piece or pieces wins. I'm afraid I need a lot of practice. Thank you very much. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. Now you will hear the recording for section two. Michael has some trouble at university. Professor Plant is having a talk with him in his office. As you listen to the talk, answer questions thirteen to seventeen. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirteen to seventeen. Now listen to the talk and answer questions thirteen to seventeen. Come in, come in. Good morning, Professor Plant. I understand you wanted to see me. Yes, Michael, I did. It's about your coursework. My coursework? I'm afraid your tutor, Mr. Atkins, has reported to me that your standard of your work has been getting worse. I know,、uh, Professor. I. He tells me that the essays you have done this term have been weak. And that your attendance at his tutorials and seminars has been poor. He has spoken to me about it, Professor. At this stage, Michael, your coursework is very important. I understand from Mr. Atkins that you are capable of an upper second, and it would be a pity to ruin your chances of a good degree, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Michael, I think you should do two things. The first is to cut down on your union activities. I understand you do a lot in the student union, and the second is to see one of our welfare tutors. To discuss any problems you may have, I'd like you to make an appointment to do that as soon as possible. All right, Professor. I'll expect to hear that your coursework has improved. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Professor, and thank you. Michael is in the welfare office. As you listen, fill in the gaps numbered eighteen to twenty-two, and answer questions twenty-three to twenty-four. First, you will have some time to look at the questions eighteen to twenty-four. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty-four. I hope I'm not late, Miss Baxter. I have an appointment for eleven o'clock. Professor Plant asked me to come. Take a seat, please. My name's Michael Andrews. I'm in my last year. Oh yes, you're chairman of the Social Science Society, aren't you? That's right. That's one of my problems. It's been taking up too much time. Surely there must be another student who could take over the job. Yes, there is someone, I suppose. There isn't anything else worrying you, is there, Mr. Andrews? Anything personal, I mean, at home, financial? You needn't feel embarrassed. There may be something I can do to help. I, er,、uh, I'm in debt. Surely you have a reasonable grant. Yes, I have, but this terms hasn't come yet, and I borrowed some money when I bought a car. I see. Now this person, well, actually he's a friend. Now he wants his money back. That seems natural enough. How much do you owe him? One hundred pounds. Well, I'm afraid it, it's against our policy to lend money to students. The only solution seems to be to sell the car. Otherwise, you'll be short of money all term. Yes, I suppose so. In any case, 
I'll ask your county to send your grant as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Michael is talking to his friend Tessa in the students' coffee bar. Cheer up, Mike. You look really down in the dumps. What's the matter? I've seen the professor this morning and the welfare tutor. They've advised me to resign as chairman of the social science society. Resign? But you've done it so well. Yes, I know, but I can't get through my work, and I've got finals coming up. I intended to work really hard last vacation, but you know what happened. I suppose it is best to resign, Mike. Peter can take over. That's not all. There's a bigger blow. Money, I suppose. Well, I owe Jim a hundred pounds. What for? The car, was it? You are a fool, Mike. I can't see how an economist can be so silly about money. I'll just have to sell the car. Well, cheer up. You can always use my bike. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You are going to listen to a lecture about using computers in education. As you listen, answer questions twenty-five to thirty-two. First, you will have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty-two. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions twenty-five to thirty-two. Good morning and welcome to this lecture. Today I'm going to talk about using computers in education. Our college, the College of English Studies, aims to provide a comprehensive range of courses for students of English as a foreign language. This range from beginners' courses through English for special purposes to preparatory courses. For students about to attend a British university, the college is now equipped with the most sophisticated teaching aids and a first-class computer centre. We have plans to use computers in language teaching, and several things are going on at the moment. In the computer centre, there are mainframe computers, a very big kind. They are already used by the administration for keeping records and making tests and this sort of thing. Now I'll particularly talk about the use of the micro or mini computers with the TV screen. And basically, the first thing we're trying to do is to put all kinds of reading comprehension tests and questions on the screens. And the idea is the student individually can select a test or a reading comprehension passage from a whole list and call it up very quickly on the screen and look at it to do the answers in that particular way. Basically. We're using it as a sort of reading device at the moment. Let's say, for example, if a student wants to practice a particular grammatical point, he just chooses it, and an exercise will come up. For example, a sentence with a part missing, and the student has to choose the correct missing part. If the student gets the answer right, then the screen immediately tells the student that, and will also tell the student why it's right. If the student gets the answer wrong, the machine will explain why it's wrong, and the student can then choose to have another try at the question or to go on to the next question. The first advantage is that students can choose the thing they want to practice or to learn. Secondly, they can get immediate feedback, individual feedback, from the machine or whether they are making progress or not, and they can give up when they are tired. Or carry on if they're not tired. They don't have to depend on the rest of the class or the rest of the group. It's very advantageous, but I think most forms of teaching and most forms of learning are not possible by computer.
I think the computer provides a lot of information when you want it, but it doesn't provide the essential feature in language learning, I think, and that is the practice of speaking to another human being or human beings. It's just an extra device, that's all. It's not intended to replace teachers, and I don't think it will replace teachers. That is the end of section three. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about university awards in Britain. As you listen, answer questions thirty-three to forty-one. First, you will have some time to look at questions thirty-three to forty-one. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 33 to 41. Good morning, everyone. This is the last talk in the series of lectures. Feel free to ask any questions during the talk, and I'll do my best to answer them. Today I'm going to talk about university awards. By that I mean the various degrees and diplomas and so on that universities give to their students. I must make it clear that my remarks will be limited to the British educational system. Different countries employ different systems. How are the university awards obtained? There are those awards which are given for the satisfactory completion of coursework and examination. The two best-known examples of these are the BA or Bachelor of Arts, and the BSc, the Bachelor of Science, at an undergraduate level. These are sometimes also called first degrees. For the obvious reason that they are the first award that a student is likely to be given by the university, there are over five thousand degree subjects and combination of subjects offered at universities throughout Britain. Bachelor level degrees are normally given at the end of three or four years coursework. Some universities offer four year courses, especially for students from overseas. The four years are made up of one preparatory year plus three years of degree courses. Courses leading to degrees in medicine, dentistry, and architecture can take from three to seven years. Diplomas are included in this category because they too meet the criteria I have laid down here. That is to say, they are also awarded on the completion of satisfactory coursework and examination. Diploma courses normally only last for one year. They are too usually more narrowly specialised and more professionally orientated. Thus, they are most often given to people who are training to be teachers or social workers and who already have a bachelor level degree. Next, there are those degrees which a university gives for successful completion of a piece of research: the MA, Master of Arts; the MSc, Master of Science. And the MBA, Master of Business Administration, are the ones most frequently awarded here at postgraduate level. At one time, these degrees were awarded only for the completion of research work, but over the past 20 years or so, a large number of additional master degrees have been introduced, which combine a quite small piece of research with a substantial amount of coursework on which the student is examined. The PhD or Doctor of Philosophy. The most prestigious research degree is, on the other hand, only awarded for a piece of research which shows great depth and considerable originality. It is expected to make a significant contribution to a knowledge of and understanding of a problem. It usually involves at least four years full-time research. Thirdly, and least commonly, there are the honorary degrees. 
These are, for example, the D-let, or Doctor of Letters, Doctor Literum, if you want it in the original Latin, the DSCs, or Doctor of Science, and the LLD, or Doctor of Laws. These awards may be, in fact often are, awarded to people who have never been to university at all. They are very often, in fact, given to people who have distinguished themselves in some field of non-academic activity outside. Thus, the university may wish to honour a famous writer by giving him a D-lit, or a famous politician by giving him or her an LLD. That's all I want to talk about today. Are there any questions? May I ask a question about the examinations? Yes, go ahead. What kind of examinations are the students going to have at the end of their coursework? Examinations can be divided into two types: objective and subjective. The objective test is designed in such a way as to require one and only one correct answer. It's considered to be a good test of factual knowledge. Examples of objective tests will consist of multiple choice and true/false questions. On the other hand, the subjective test allows for many possible ways of expressing an answer. Sometimes it even accepts completely different answers from different people, such as essays and interviews. Thank you very much. Well, if you want any more information, please feel free to come and talk to me. That is the end of section four. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers.